Did anyone try and test you? Well, again, I was looking like I looked in that picture. That was taken from the Canadian pen. Yeah. And gunfights with the police, um, you know, the newspapers. I sort of had my mana intact. But of course, they're watching. And they tried to, a couple of times they tried to trick me into stuff. For example, one time they saw that I was running. I used to run a lot around the track, my weight partner and I. And so one of these guys sent a, one of these Quebecois fellows up to me and he said, you got a lot of money on your books. Because at this time, unfortunately, the inmate committee members had access to how much money everybody had on their mm. books. And they saw, I, I had a job sort of teaching remedial students with this prison educational program, and they paid me real money. They paid me like a thousand dollars a term, wow. which for prisoners huge. was huge. And he says, you're the richest inmate in the joint. <laughs> and I went, oh, <laughs> shit. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so they, these guys thought how they're going to get me. They saw I was a runner. So they sent this guy to me and they said, uh, there's some guys want to want to make a bet, want to make some bets. I said, well, what do they want to make bets on? He says, well, he says, they bet they can beat you running. He says, and uh, they're liable to put up money. I mean, real money on this. And I said, well, how much money? He says, well, I don't know. How much would you be willing to go for? And so we talked some more and the deal is they've got these one one tall, lithe, sporty Indian, and then this half black guy who's like an antelope. I mean, he's he's naturally athletic. But the thing is, I'd never seen them run before, so I didn't know if they could go the distance or if they were really fast and they'd smoke me or what would happen. So I decided to try and hedge my bets, and I said, "Well, can I pick out two other guys from my team? Seeing as how you got two on that team, can we can, can we have three on our team?" And they said, sure, because they didn't think anyone else could run. So they come down to it and they say, okay, we're going to have a race. How much money are we putting on it? And I say to this Frenchman, I say, because I'm thinking to myself, these guys are trying to set me up. But I thought to myself, if you're going to ambush me, I'm going to ambush you. <laughs> so I says to the Frenchman, I said, take every bet, take every carton they want to put up. Whatever it is they want to bet, we'll cover it. And he was as happy as could be because this was real activity, right? I mean, the joint, it's pretty slow the every day to day, but now they got something. <laughs> They're going to have a real race with real money. And these people have real, not, I won't call it antagonism, but there was this sort of dope fiends from Vancouver on this side. And there were some big um, like kingpins from Vancouver, guys who'd like arranged the dope. And, they're, and they're, they, they took the whole, the whole group. So they had a whole group there, actually much like the group you, you had, right? <laughs> so the day for the day for the race came and everybody's out, you know, they're on the bleachers, people are making side bets. All of a sudden time is real. It's not, you're in the prison, you're almost at the racetrack or something, right? And the race starts and these guys take off. And this black guy, he, uh, he was like watching an antelope run. He was smooth and just like silk. And when I run, I go red in the face and I'm chugging away, right? But it's a mile run. And these guys just take off because, of course, they want to look good in front of their mates, right? So away they go. And I'm thinking to myself, you, you boys, you, this is a mile run. I don't know, do you run? Jog. No, I'm not, not that good. Well, a mile run's not like 10 kilometers. 10 kilometers, you go to speed. But a mile run is a race. Anyway, so... The race runs and I come third and my other two guys come first and second and both these guys don't finish the race. So we smoked and we got all the money. They paid up. They, well, they, they paid up because these the sleazy dope fiends wouldn't have paid, but the money actually came from the, the kingpins. For them, it was just entertainment. Chump change. Yeah, it's chump change to just you know be entertained in an afternoon. There's a bit of buzz. Everybody has a good time. <laughs> so, so you said there was a few times they tried to trick you what else did they well, do well I, I used to run a book like on betting because the big problem in, in the joint is you know debts like 
you might want to bet a game, but do you really have a carton of cigarettes in your pocket to put up on the debt on the bet? But if you have somebody who will take the bets and lay off the bets, who you trust who will pay up, that it makes it possible. And I like to, you know, in, in the joint, you're always looking for something to do. I mean, it's going to be interesting. And so betting on the games was a bit of being outside. It was like, you know, the guys related to it. So I used to um, take bets. And fortunately, I, I, I discovered something which, of course, bet bookies probably already know. And that's that it, once you, what you want to do is you want to catch a group of degenerate gamblers. I mean, complete addicts who can't help themselves, but who have money. And fortunately for me, there were two Chinese dr uh, drug, drug importers, and there was a bent stockbroker. And these guys, the bent stockbroker couldn't, for, for the life of him, if he bet one side of a bet, you knew they were going to lose. You could just throw <laughs> your inheritance on it. And so these guys, and so what happened, of course, is that, again, this this group, the old kingpins want, you know, they start trying to overload me on one side to catch me out. Mm -hmm. Now, they're cooler than in San Quentin. In San Quentin, the prison gang might just come up on you with knives. These guys were, they were pretty cool. They try and trick you into doing something you're already doing, but make push you to go too far. Mm. So, fortunately, I was able to, because I was, because I had this money, I was able to fund it. And so I could, I never, never got caught. So outside of your entrepreneurial activity, what did you do to fill your time for the rest of your sentence in Canada? Well, I was really lucky because they had something called the prison education system. And it was out of uh, uh, the university in British Columbia, the uh, Simon Fraser and the University of Victoria. And they had a group of, um, how would you call them, lefties. Um, Actually, one of them was English, Socialist Workers' Party, used to work for the BBC. And this group, they wanted to, um, they had a, an idea that teaching humanities to prisoners might awaken an awareness of the values of Western culture and that people would make the conscious choice not to be criminals. And so this ethos they they brought in humanities courses, literature and art and history and psychology and philosophy. And the idea was to, um, one, get prisoners to get university degrees. So they Did were... you already have a degree? No, I didn't. Okay. I didn't finish my degree because I went to prison. What subject was it you were doing? I was doing Japanese studies. Okay. But of course, the university wasn't doing Japanese studies. So I took, and anyway, I, this is, I died and gone to heaven basically with this because you know, the usual books in prison are dusters and uh, just cheap, you know, murder fiction and sci-fi and stuff. But these guys were actually intelligent, committed uh, people who were bringing in real books. And we were, and, and I had, I would have a tutorial with, with a full professor from the university one-on-one -on -one for an hour. I mean, just things that you'd never conceive of. Like if you were a paying student now, imagine, You'd be lucky now if you saw your professor for 15 minutes and you didn't just, you know. So with this prison education program, I got right into it. And I finally, I got my degree. And then I started teaching for them in the prison to the other prisoners, different things, mostly remedial stuff. And I got paid. And I, you know, we started publishing a prison journal and we got involved with outside, bringing outside groups in like students from the university doing criminology would come in and we'd organize sort of get togethers between prisoners and students so they could ask their questions directly with no mediation between, you know, books or teachers and such like. So it was, it was really good. I mean, I, I've got to give those guys credit. Of course, the programs disappeared. It was defunded when they went back to the old punishment regime, but the prison education program from the University of Victoria was excellent. So how did it feel to go from this high adrenaline lifestyle then to be teaching people, prisoners? A third of the prisoners where our house couldn't even read or write. And I was assigned at one point to uh, help them 
do some stuff for the high school, the, the GED, I think it's called. So to go from this wild lifestyle and help, helping other people, how did that feel? Well, it wasn't a hard transition because my mother was a university professor and I grew up around universities. So I sort of knew how to carry myself. And I'd been a student before I was busted. And so in a sense, I'd got that stuff out of my system. But I, I think, what do they call it when uh, a boy wants to turn into a man, a rite of passage? Yeah. Well, that was my rite of passage going to San Quentin, basically. Baptism of fire. Yeah, I knew who I was after that, and I was secure in myself. And that that means something. And I, I, of course, you know, that's 11 years spent inside. But you can't look at what is time wasted? I mean, is time wasted working at the Lloyds Bank for 11 years, uh, you know, punching the computer screen? Is that, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> mm-hmm. What else did I learn? I learned how to play badminton in prison. What about chess? My tennis game improved. In Canada, I must say, has got some good sports facilities. And did you play any chess? The guy's chess is checkers is their game. Checkers, okay. Prisoners in America, chess is a bit too cerebral for them. <laughs> We're talking checkers. Did you play chess with anybody? Yeah, yeah. There was heavyweight chess players in Arizona, uh-huh. definitely. They schooled me. I thought I knew a thing or two because I was in a chess club when I was a kid. I went in there, got my ass whooped right away. I had to have my parents sending in chess books so I could learn all these uh, opening moves and all that kind of stuff. These guys, like they like gambling, poker. But of course, I wouldn't sit down with anybody because in in Canada, for example, that bent stockbroker I was telling you about, he came in, he brought $5,000 up his ass and he... He, I guess he wanted to buy friends or something, try and protect him against the... Uh... So he sat down at the poker table and there were six guys playing. And of course, he lost his $5,000 like in about three days. Yeah. And what he didn't know was that every single person was playing. They're all, they all they were all playing together. He got hustled. He got hustled. Mm-hmm. You know. So I wouldn't play games with people because... Like if you start playing chess with somebody, the next thing they want to start betting cigarettes, or and it, you know the guy's going to try and hustle you. Yeah, I never, I never um, staked anything on my games. It was just sportsman's pleasure. Well, that's all right if you can maintain it like that. Yeah, 